Okay, today uh, we'll talk about infrared spectroscopy. Spectroscopy works when given electromagnetic force strong enough given to the um, sample and sample has their own intrinsic frequencies coming from all the nuclei spin, electron spin, vibrations, stretching vibrations of bond or bending vibrations of two or more bonds as a, a group. Those frequencies, when we give a proper uh, light with a, you know, similar frequencies, we can detect because nuclei and bonds they have different frequencies we can choose the right kind of a, a light source to choose what motions we try to um, detect then the um, input light will be interact getting absorbed fully or partially or not at all depends on the situation we talked about the output is coming out with a weaker um, intensity or no intensity at all or untouched uh, intensity depends on the frequency so each frequency and their intensity uh, of the light that's coming through we are plotting them out on the spectrum so we can um, discover what's uh, going on inside of small size of sample so the light photon have two uh, forces electric field perpendicular to that magnetic field and the photon has no mass it's not material but it travels at the speed of light regardless of the kinds of uh, uh, light you are choosing. The only difference is how frequently their polarity changes in the space as they travel at the speed of light. That determines the individual photon's energy. And um, to detect the vibration, we are um, choosing infrared. The infrared light has the uh, wavelength uh, somewhat greater than 700 nanometer, somewhat longer, and uh, less than 10,000 nanometer. Then the wave num number, a kind of frequency we talked about, uh, casually for organic chemicals we are looking at around 4000 reciprocal centimeter to 400 but if you are dealing with organometallics with the heavy metals the heavy atoms in it the vibration seems to be slower because it's heavy so you uh, will look at uh, even 40 30 10 depends on the uh, you know the type of bonds and the type of uh, metals you have in the vibration and those vibrations um, carries about a couple tens of kilocalories per mole. And type of the uh, motion you are um, um, stimulating is the vibration and the rotation that happens in the time scale of nano to femtosecond. So when the photon is interacting with the uh, matters, of course, depends on the frequency, you can um, excite the vibration with the IR range of light and the uh, radio wave of light can change the spin of the nuclei and also for UV uh, light, you can change the um, states of the electron especially for IR some bonds are nonpolar so it is important for you to relate with the polarity and their absorptivity so when photon go through each bond it will get uh, pushed or pulled so a certain amount of the force of the photon the electric field will be exerted so the vibration gets more vigorous in the quantum um, 
world, the uh, certain vibrations are only allowed it. So uh, it's not going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, but twice, three times more a vibronic uh, state. It will go up to get excited to there. Then the photon will be absorbed by the chemical and get disappeared. Then the detector detects whether the light is going through or not. So the um, absorptivity or the transmittance are the two ways of um, showing the chemicals interacting with the light how well or how poorly. So in organic uh, class, you'll see the plot done according to the uh, absorptivity and the ab absorptivity and the transmittance has a certain relationship shown here and as you see a certain peak regarded to certain functional group can have a multiple absorption by many uh, frequency and why is the case well uh, one of the main absorbance will be from one frequency that matches with the uh, intrinsic vibration of the object but the one with a slight difference uh, the photon uh, still can be absorbed but not as effectively so uh, those uh, frequencies not the best the one with the exact uh, frequency will have some amount of the uh, absorption but also, um, there are a couple other regions, the chemical regions. The chemical bond can change. The uh, atoms are not changing quite, but the strength of the bond is changing due to the interaction with the uh, environment. Especially the polar compounds, they have polar polarity that allows them to interact with the um, solvents or any neighboring molecules. Therefore, you expect the, the vibration can, you know, actually uh, affect it and change. So the frequency also do change. Then you expect um, those affected frequency can match with the uh, uh, other frequency. So along with the uh, nuclei spin or electron spin that's going on in this exact same molecule at the same time, you can see the uh, charge, the polar functional group will vibrate always. So it will generate certain frequency we talked about. And then uh, when we are giving, uh, say, the vibration similar to this, this vibration, which is this vibration here, is not going to get affected by the photon. However, this will be affected only specifically so you are able to promote this vibration state from the ground quantum state to the excited quantum state because it's matching. And then when you give photon that has frequency similar to this, then only this functional group will be absorbing the photon and photon is disappearing. So the machine is detecting that that particular frequency here is disappeared. So uh, it will plot the uh, disappearance as a transmittance or convert it to, it to the uh, absorbance mathematically and plot them out for us. So this is the IR instrument commonly uh, found in a uh, research lab. And this middle portion here is where you put your sample. Uh, you can just insert sample through this window after you slide the glassy window. Or you can uh, undo the hatch and lift up the uh, cover. And you can uh, set up a special uh, uh, conditions for your special sample if you have and uh, most likely by looking at the uh, machine the laser is located this area so you may see lighting coming through uh, the behind panel then the sample is gonna get light through this direction and that's where you find the um, detector 
and you put the sometimes uh, liquid nitrogen to cool down because the IR is known as a uh, heat light so it is constantly generating heat and any um, object with a temperature is emitting IR as well so this detector is getting uh, saturated by heat then the sensitivity for detection get lower therefore we need to take away the heat to maintain the optimum condition for the um, detection then in the middle you have all kinds of uh, mirrors and uh, other components to make this uh, IR working and uh, this in uh, this FT um, Fourier transformation uh, IR has a special moving mirror parts high hidden here somewhere. Then this will this unit will be uh, connected to computer to analyze the electric signal. Uh, you know uh, proportional to the uh, transmittance. Each photon that's coming out will be converted to the uh, electricity. Okay, now let me show you the um, schematics uh, of the um, IR inside to explain how it works. So here we had IR light source special bulb that generates the um, variety of infrared frequencies that coming out at once. Or these days we are using laser for a particular uh, purpose. Then you find these sets of mirrors. So and those mirrors have a special angle set to guide the original lights to go to the chamber with the sample in it. So this green box area is the compartment you saw before in the machine. You can open up and put your sample here. And you'll find another place for reference. At this point, depends on the type of machine, I have to comment, you may have two beam source, so you can place the two sample cells at once, one real sample with the unknown, and the other with the uh, other empty cells with the same solvent in it. Only difference between them will be this sample cell should have sample in it but the other reference should have the same sample holder same solvent and everything same if you have a buffer same buffer so you can compare and some labs equipped with the IR machine that has only one beam then um, you have a couple different types as well. That one beam um, IR has moving sample holder. So when you do first operation, it asks you to do the background. So the motor will take the reference cell to this single beam so the light can go through the reference then the machine will automatically shift and put the sample on the beam assuming there is only a single beam all right so you can get ready for measuring sample and then there is a somewhat simpler uh, model you actually have one beam with one sample holder, not moving parts uh, included. So you have to first put reference here and then click on the computer to measure uh, absorbance of the uh, reference. Then you put the sample there again, uh, measure the absorbance of the sample. Then the computer will automatically compare the two and give you the pure absorbance by the 
unknown compound. Then you find more mirrors that will guide light to the choppers. Then um, these output lights from reference or the sample, it will be different from the input light after interaction with a certain frequency of the uh, physical uh, object. Then they reach the chopper and the chopper is going to allow and machine knows which light is leading to this mirror okay this mirror and the head to the detector so this chopper allows machine to bring in reference or the sample uh, light so here in the uh, part of the uh, machine you saw before you have detector unit and there you have also a couple mirrors guiding light to reach the um, uh, wavelength selector so these days you are using laser that has all uh, light frequencies combined in a way and then allow them interact with the sample at once to make the measurement more efficient and uh, uh, faster and uh, also lower the uh, noises then uh, from here you can change the angle you can change the uh, angle of the wavelength selector and the one at a time using those little mirrors very shiny and multiple mirrors you find to allow them interfere each other and intensifying the light signal and so on and the light is finally able to reach the detector so as the machine change this um, mirror the um, special mirror a certain wavelength is selected and the machine knows what wavelength is heading to the detector and the um, machine measures the uh, intensity of the light that passed through the sample and this is the unit that needs to be cooled down constantly because it's the thermal conductor and uh, now let's talk about how to prepare sample that goes to the sample holder so you can have solid liquid and gas sample and solid can be measured as a solid or turn that into the liquid by dissolving it into a certain solvent but you should know solvent has interference because it will also absorb uh, uh, infrared so that might cover up the signal that's coming from your sample so it is always better to treat the pure sample not as a solution mixture and uh, we can have a gas of course so here uh, you see you know uh, mortar and pestle with the solid sample in it so you may put one or two milligram amount of the uh, sample there but it's obviously uh, something that you need to determine by trial and error but assuming that the sample has a standard absorptivity with a standard uh, you know uh, polarity of the general organic compound then a couple milligrams of sample with a couple grams of a KBR, potassium bromide. Potassium bromide is very heavy. So they absorb IR for their own vibration, but it's going to be away from the area where you get the light, carbon, oxygen, you know, hydrogen, nitrogen, that kind of area of the IR frequency. 
So since most of the organic compounds are not uh, clear, transparent crystal, you cannot have the light go through well. So you have to make it transparent. That's why we are doing this. And we grind them up very nicely and then mix them up also very nicely. Then you put them into one of these uh, a tool here. All of these are not one uh, set. Okay, there are a variety of different sets. Depends on the uh, nature of your crystal. The crystal is not gonna get a uh, pure uh, clear disc of the KBR with the sample in it. Then you need to use a different set. If something is easy to come up with a transparent uh, sample discs, then you can use the simple stuff. The simple thing you can see here, you need only use a couple of, uh, you know, nuts and put your sample there and then you can simply twist it, twist the nuts and bolts with the regular spanner and it'll work. And uh, some other more difficult case or you have, uh, you need to make a bigger disc because concentration is low or the sample doesn't have a strong absorptivity and so on, you can uh, put the sample inside of this uh, uh, metal unit after lifting this uh, inside cylinder metal cylinder and then put that in then you pressurize this with the uh, heavy machinery the machine has place for the assembly of those the cylinder and the you know uh, the container of sample then you pressurize it it could be as a simple but some um, disc maker uh, has really huge hydraulic uh, pressing uh, cylinders and it's uh, quite heavy sometimes you can uh, see maybe I hope and if you are making solid sample in this unit you can use it without taking the clear disc out of it And in other case, after making transparent a little uh, disc, you have to put it in a uh, disc holder like this to place it into the sample compartment of the IR instrument. So this is the one sample of disc. Um, this wouldn't be the uh, one of the best uh, transparency you can get, but sometimes you have to live with it. So you can try and see. If it doesn't work out, you have to use a more heavier uh, unit or uh, go with a lower concentration, mixing a little less amount of the uh, sample with the KBR powder. And the ideal transparency would be something like this. Like this. Um, yeah, you can get this very often for the regular sample. But this one you see is the uh, commercially available, available clear KBR disc and it has its own usage. Um, so let me explain that. And these are pure KBR discs, right? And one, two, there's, uh, there are, there are uh, one set. And you can notice that there, is, there are two holes. And this also come in in a square rectangular form and for those as well, in a pair, you find one perfect and the other with the holes. So this is the assembly that uses the uh, rectangular form of the KBR window. One here, the other one there. And between them, you have a plastic spacer inset. Okay, So we know the size of it. So this assembly is used for very accurate measurement. You know exact volume. Then using the Beer's Law, you know exact concentration. Then you can actually calculate the exact, exact number of moles that you have. And you can do a lot more stuff. So this spacer is, spacer is a very accurate one. So if you ever uh, have to do experiment with this set, you should not ruin 
the spacer. Also, I want you to notice that here you have um, the um, perfect pair, a uh, perfect side of the uh, KBR and the other one with the two holes that I mentioned before. And that's going to be connected to these holes up here. And notice that you don't have a hole at the bottom. So this is how it looks when it's uh, completely assembled and you have these, you know, bolts, tighten hole assembly up and you find those two holes with the cap on it. And this unit is to uh, uh, stop evaporation or leaking of liquid. So, uh, you know, this is for liquid sample or the solid sample that is uh, uh, dissolved in a liquid. In order to insert the uh, sample enough to fill in the little space you saw before, you have to remove the two caps. And then using the syringe here, you take the sample without bubble, then put sample through one opening until the sample leaks out the other end through the other end then you know you have enough before you remove the syringe you have to cap this and carefully remove the syringe not to uh, suck out anything by doing it uh, suddenly then as you put the last cap on also be careful not to have a, a bubble going inside then you're all set. That's when you do, uh, you know, the uh, measurement that's required for a high precision. However, for a casual uh, measurement, just detecting functional group, you can use these two uh, discs and put a couple drops of your liquid sample or the solid sample in a liquid form in a solution then just cover up then put it in the um, sample holder in the compartment all right so um, this one is the sample holder for um, gas so the light will go through this way so you place the sample as you uh, check the light path in the compartment then uh, when you insert the gas using syringe or a tank you connect it to one of the two openings and leave the other one open and flush it enough so you can expel all the um, airs and have a pure uh, sample inside and if you measure out the pressure you know, over here you can uh, attach a pressure gauge and we know this volume and you know the pressure then using ideal gas law you can find out how many moles of the um, gas you actually put in so you can apply it to the Beer's law as well then this piece here as you can see there is opening so you have to put you have to put or sometimes you find it in the um, sample compartment of the IR instrument understanding that light has to go through this uh, opening you are placing the discs or the assembly of the discs on these two arms so you have to imagine the light coming out of uh, one side of the chamber going into the other side of the chamber through this and you should not block the light path okay you need to hold a certain uh, piece of uh, paper or uh, metal so you can check the uh, light source the laser hits uh, a particular point on that um, held the paper or a metal then you know uh, where your sample holder should be in summary to wrap up this video you know this 
in more detail now. Uh, the input light hits the sample and you're going to detect and with the IR frequency you are exciting the vibration of the uh, model so you can see that you have OH functional group or uh, SP3CH functional group or the SP2CH is three different types and uh, double bond carbon carbon or carbon chlorine single bond and their vibrations you can detect but you can detect more obviously when it's a stronger signal and the intensity of the signal if you remember has to do with the concentration so you have a uh, three of the uh, sp 2 ch vibration so they will come in a stronger signal than one ch sp3 ch bond however oh bond is much stronger although it's only one of them because it's a, a lot more polar than those uh, CH bonds. And also CCL bond will be uh, somewhat strong, not as strong as OH, not as strong as a CO because of the uh, polarity uh, greatest being greatest uh, on uh, around uh, oxygen, but still it's greater than any other uh, absorptivity. So that's what we are um, expecting when we start discussion on IR on the next video. So until then, 